welcome. Legally Brief presents Changing Our Institutions. I'm your host, Judy Saunders. I'm a lawyer who works with private and public companies, educational institutions, and sports organizations to identify root causes, confront historic failures, and boldly implement change to our institutions. This podcast is for corporate change agents, disruptors, and mindset mavericks who are committed to making our institutions work better for themselves and the next generation. I want to remind you that while I hope you enjoy every episode in the series that we're doing on changing our institutions, the content of this programming is not a substitute for speaking directly with an attorney who understands your unique circumstances. If you're looking for past episodes or information, please head on over to my website. There you'll find information and you can sign up for newsletters and you can learn more about me and my practice. I'm glad you're here. Let's get ready and let's talk and make some changes. Hello, and welcome back to Legally Brief. Today, I have a conversation with Professor Marcy Hamilton, the founder and CEO of Child USA, a nonprofit academic think tank dedicated to evidence based research to improve laws and public policy that seek to end child abuse and neglect. Professor Hamilton is a leading expert on clergy sex abuse and child sex abuse statute of limitations. She's the author of several books one of which, Justice Denied, What America Must Do to Protect Its Children, advocates for the elimination of child sex abuse statute of limitations. During my conversation with Professor Hamilton, we will discuss her clerkship for the first United States female justice, Sandra Day O'Connor. We also talk about the work that Child USA is doing to remove obstacles that survivors of sex abuse encounter when trying to access courts and hold perpetrators accountable. In our discussion about the Game Over Commission, Professor Hamilton and I talk about how Child USA brought together experts from around the country to investigate why elite athletes encountered systemic failures at every level, whether it was sporting associations, law enforcement, and the FBI, and how the work that she did with the Game Over Commission provides recommendations so that we can avoid this happening again. Professor Hamilton is a true disruptor to institutions that seek to harm children. I hope you enjoy this conversation with Professor Marcy Hamilton. Hello and welcome back to another episode during Women's History Month. I can't believe that my audience and I are so fortunate to have this guest today during this month, Marcy Hamilton. And Marcy, there are so many things that I want to talk about. I know that I can't take up your entire we're recording this on a Friday. So I want to dive right in, Marcy, with starting about, and I'm going to try my best to get this out to our listeners during Women's History Month, because there are so many things going on right now, and I couldn't think of a better guest and a better topic, a better time to bring more awareness to the work that you do right now in this point in your life and Child USA, just to give some context around Marcy, around Women's History Month, the impact, what, when we say Women's History Month, I know that a lot of times so many things are going on in the world that it can become almost background noise. So let's put it into context a little bit for the listeners. There are over 166 million, we're talking about in America now, in the U.S., women, females, will identifying as females in the U.S., over 166 million in the world it's estimated that there's 3.9 billion. That's just an estimate. And if we look at some other numbers about women and women, the impact and who we are 
as this species, as this gender. It's estimated that almost 34% of women 25 or older hold a bachelor's degree or some other type of higher degree. Again, another statistic for individuals identifying as women, if we look at women ages 16 or older in the workforce today, that there's almost 80 million. And the last one, to give some context about what we're celebrating this month, there's 81, almost 82% of identifying female full-time workers who are, I said 16 or over, but when I say that statistic, almost 82%, that's how much they're earning when they're compared against their male counterparts. So we still have that wage gap. That's not what we're going to discuss today, but that's giving some context. And then to put a question before you, when recently President Biden nominated Judge Katanji Brown Jackson during this month to the U.S. Supreme Court, And I wanted you to weigh in on that because we know that with that nomination, that is the first time an African-American woman was nominated for this seat. What are your thoughts given the impact? I stated those numbers about how many women are out there identifying as women. We are a powerful force. When we think about who we are in this world, the numbers that we bring and celebrating this month, and then thinking about kind of bringing this to a head with this historic nomination. What are some of your thoughts on that? Thanks so much for having me, Judy. This is an important month to remember our most important women. And I am very excited about the fact that President Biden would choose Judge Katanji Brown-Jackson I had the privilege of clerking for Justice O'Connor, the first female on the Supreme Court. And that came with it a real mantle that she had to bear of being the first woman. And one of the things that was most interesting was that that meant she was the most in demand justice. Everybody wanted the first female justice of the United States Supreme Court to speak at their event. And honestly, it was events from the most high-minded international events on democracy and issues like that, all the way down to associations. Like, I remember writing a speech for the X-Ray Association. So she was our messenger that a woman has heft and has uh, the ability to be incredibly professional. And that set the tone for the women at the Supreme Court, and we've been blessed to have several follow her. But what's different about Judge Jackson is not as much, I mean, it is her being Black, but it's also that she comes from the perspective of someone who was a public defender. That is a perspective that has never been at the court. And the reason it's going to make a huge difference is because when she is in that locked room during conference, she, of course, is the junior justice, with fingers crossed she gets confirmed, but she will be in conference with the justices. And that occurs at the end of the oral argument weeks. And during conference, they discuss the cases and they assign who is going to write the cases. They go around the table in seniority. Each of them tells the other justices, what they think of a case. At the end of the round, they then realize, well, who would be in the majority? And the most senior justice in that majority assigns the opinion. She will be, first of all, she will be taking the notes because the most junior justice is the note taker. So she will be (laughs) writing the history that will inform generations beyond. But they're going to hear from someone who knows the other side of the law. And the fact that she speaks from the perspective of being a Black woman, combined with the perspective of knowing the legal system and how it is operated on the side of the defendants, I think she's going to bring a voice that is so needed and that will educate everybody in the room and make her truly a great justice. You know, Marcy, and I knew that the part of our discussion, our conversation, where we would talk just a little bit about what you know 
firsthand about the U.S. Supreme Court was going to be an absolute and absolute brilliant part of this conversation because you're giving us kind of almost a backstage view as to what's going on. And when you mention, you give us this visual about Judge Jackson being in that locked room, being in having those discussions, it takes me to a prior, I had seen you on a panel in, I think it was a, a couple of years ago, 2019. It was a C-SPAN audio video rather with the Ronald Reagan Institute. You were on a panel there and you mentioned during that time that you clerked, I think it was, was it 1989 to 1990 for um, Justice O'Connor? And you had mentioned that there was an exchange between you and Justice O'Connor and your response to that, well, you know, you're not being invited to those meetings. And in fact, no women were invited to those meetings. Do you remember that that exchange? It made me think of what you just said about Judge Jackson. I'm not quite sure which, I mean, she was the first woman to ever be inside the conference meetings. Right. Let me give you some context. I think it was during that discussion that you were having on that panel, you had mentioned how some of the clerks, yourself and other clerks, there were a, an array of different viewpoints. And the clerks were talking about, and I think it was in particular the Casey reproductive rights case. Oh, right. Yes. And some of the clerks were talking about, you know, the, the way they were going to maybe start to write their drafts and, you know, the opinions and the different briefings, briefing papers. And I believe that Justice O'Connor had made a mention to you. Well, are you part of that? Are you being invited to some of those meetings? And if I remember correctly, it was something along the lines, you know, you being one of the female clerks on the Supreme Court, you know, there weren't a lot of women in those meetings. So, and that just makes me think how fast forward now to 2022, not only do we have the other sitting justices, you know, female justices that are on the Supreme Court, but now we can have, as you were saying, we can have someone that has served as a federal prosecutor. So that, to me, is a true celebration of Women's History Month. Well, let me just explain what was going on when I was the clerk at the court. So the group I was talking about was self-named the Cabal. It was a group of conservative Republican men who were all clerks. And, you know, they were inspired by the Federalist Society, if not in direct contact with them frequently. And they would meet to put together the conservative agenda that they would push with their justices. Interesting. And women were not welcomed at those meetings. I never would have been. I was, first of all, not conservative enough. And I was a woman. So, but what would happen is because I was the clerk that Justice O'Connor assigned to do the abortion cases, all of them that year, <laughs> they, they would trail me around and, and try to figure out what she was thinking about these issues. And I learned very quickly that there was absolutely no way that I was going to reveal anything she was thinking about the abortion cases, really because I didn't want to give these clerks the idea that I was somehow going to be a spy for them. Because one, I found the cabal offensive. I still find the cabal concept offensive. And there are two reasons to be offended. One, you go into the court, you know, Lady Justice is blindfolded. For a group to be meeting in closed door sessions in order to manipulate the court is just not true justice. Justice happens when those nine justices close the door and lock the rest of us out. But the other reason I found it offensive is because this was a group of really young lawyers, right? In those days, you went straight from law school. You know, I went to the Third Circuit Court of Appeals in Philly, clerk for the inimitable uh, Judge Edward Becker, then went straight to clerking for Justice O'Connor. The hubris, uh, any two years out law student thinking that they should be shaping the nation's Supreme Court doctrine is beyond my capacity to understand. So this was um, not a female-friendly group, but also it was a representation of 
what was happening with respect to the forces that were against women. Because one of the things that we're primarily doing was, of course, plotting to end uh, Roe v. Wade. And so looking back on it, it was uh, really, really troubling. Uh, but the but the farther I get away from it, the more troubled I am by it. But now that you've got, I mean, it's very possible we'll have four women on the court and one of them will have the perspective from a side of the law none of them have ever experienced. That's heartwarming. I, and I say that, you know, knowing that, you know, public defenders really don't love extending the statute of limitations on anything. So, you know, my career is dedicated to ending the statute of limitations on child sex abuse globally. Um, but setting aside that personal perspective, this will revolutionize the worldview in that locked room. Right. And, you know, this is going to go a little bit outside, but you brought up so many good just tidbits right there. One, I was at the gym, Marcy, this morning. And I saw the news flash. I hadn't yet gone onto my phone and read the news feed, but did you see in Florida with uh, it passed the Florida Senate, the local Senate there, the bill that would ban abortions at 15 weeks? And it just makes me think of this, you know, this group that was pushing their agenda. And it was a little shocking to see that. But, you know, and then to hear also, you know, you tell of this firsthand account, it just speaks volumes to the need for diversity in every sense, not just in, you know, ethnicity or gender, in in ideas. It speaks volumes for a need to do that. Wow. Okay. So uh, turning then, you brought up the work, what you're dedicated to doing as far as ending statute of limitations when they, as they relate to child abuse. Anyone that listens to this show knows that I am walking lockstep in that goal, in that mission. In fact, Marcy, if you recall, the reason, one of the reasons that I became aware of Child USA and of wor- your work was through the representation of clients that I had, um, young athletes that I had who had suffered different psychological, emotional abuse. And I know about what your organization has done. I was listening to a recording of your book launch, one of the book launches in Princeton in 2008. And during that, during when you were talking, you mentioned that one of the things that was important was that America understand and that they know about the statute of limitations and how they're being used against them. Talk to us a little bit about these statute of limitations, what they are, and what America needs to know. Well, of course, this is my passion project for my career. Um, it's an odd one for a law professor who was doing you know, high-level First Amendment work, having clerked at the United States Supreme Court. I had every intent of being the egghead of all time. But what happened is, is that I won uh, the case Bernie v. Flores at the United States Supreme Court. And ironically, I all of a sudden found myself on the other side of every organized religion in the United States. And I won. And so, uh, and the court declared the Religious Freedom Restoration Act unconstitutional. That turned my career uh, in a path. I'm going to say this because I think it helps to explain how I could be so dedicated to this future. In the middle of that Supreme Court case, which was so contentious, and I was being characterized as anti-religion, even though I'm Presbyterian. I mean, here's the fact. I'm not anti-religion, but it turns out I really am opposed to religious believers and organizations breaking the law at will. And so I was the only law professor in the country dealing in those issues, and literally the 2002 Spotlight Report out of Boston fell in my lap. All of a sudden, you had accusations of widespread orchestrated child sex abuse in the Catholic Church, and you had the Catholic Church in court arguing religious liberty protected them from producing discovery or even being in court. And so I became the law professor that was out there making the arguments for how it's not possible to say that the First Amendment immunizes 
such bad actors from the law. And, you know, we won a series of cases, especially with the 2003 California window cases. And I talked to so many attorneys that I became educated in a way that no law and religion scholar ever normally would be. But I kept seeing these briefs, and in the briefs would be one person a uh, victim was suing, but in one case, the other three victims, all family members, they weren't able to sue because of the statute of limitations. And I started asking around, what the heck is going on here? They have the facts. There's such bad actors on the other side, even if they are religious, and they can't even go to court. And the answer was, yeah, that's one of the primary me reasons that victims never get to court. And so I immediately thought, okay, all right, this is so ridiculous that as soon as we get the word out to everybody that this is a problem, it'll get fixed. And then I'll go back to doing my egghead research right. in constitutional law. That was the plan. <laughs> that was a literal plan. That was the plan. So I wrote Justice Denied. And... It literally, you know, makes the case for SOL reform. I threw it out into the world and I pivoted and I was going back, but I got pulled back in when the lawyer and his wife from Denver, the lawyers for uh, Archbishop Shapu there, wrote a book review. And the book review was called Marcy's World. It was misogynist. It was an attempt to put me in my place. It criticized me for charging high rates per hour. I was a Supreme Court clerk, a pretty smart one. So my rate was really market rate. Um, and they took apart the book. And of course, I was anti-religious and it was published in a Catholic publication. So I thought if, if I ruffled that many feathers, then at least I've got to follow through and just make sure I explain these things and, and these things get passed into law working with SNAP, working with, um, you know, some of the real founders in the movement like Barbara Blaine. And, and here I am. I ended up leaving my professorship at Cardozo Law School where I had a chair in public law and came to Penn on the condition that I would teach here, but only if I could have time to start a nonprofit. And that's why I started Child USA. So that's the birth of Child USA. So Marcy, so it sounds as if you or would you is it fair to say you were an accidental disruptor? You had just planned to do this, and you I'm sorry, I should have said the book in 2008 was Justice Denied: What America Must Do to Protect Children. So that was the book. You, it sounds like you thought you'd put that book out. Go back to your position. Go back to what you were doing, what you loved, and it, like you said, ruffled feathers, disrupt an institution. Is it fair to say that you disrupted? Oh, no question. I, I mean, <laughs> I really had never thought of myself as a disruptor. I was a really nice girl born in Texas and raised in, in Illinois. But in law school, I caused a stir because I was editor in chief of the Penn Law Review. And I objected when they were going to deny tenure to a brilliant philosopher, Drusilla Cornell. I did not make a lot of fans at my law school among the faculty because, you know, they decided she didn't deserve tenure. And I was criticizing that decision in the press. So I think I'd already begun to be a disruptor. Um, but, and, you know, I defended authors and artists' rights to their own works rather than having everything given to the recording companies early on in my career. So but I never intended to be a disruptor that would take on every single organized religion in the United States. That's not something anybody would do rationally. And the other thing is, what law professor, what you know, high-minded intellectual law professor? I mean, I was researching the founding of the, the, the religious influence on the framing of the United States Constitution. Who chooses statute of limitations? I mean, that is one boring procedural barrier that you would never put in until you find out that there are forces in society that are willing to sacrifice children and the protection of children through this simple mechanism. And it was so nauseating. And the more I found out that it was the bishops up front, but insurance behind, the more I decided, well, we're going to get the truth out. I started sol-reform.com, the first website six research assistants a semester in law school. 
And then I came out of Cardozo and came to Penn and started Child USA. And it's blossomed because there was a need for it. There's definitely a need for it. You had mentioned before some of the kind of leaders and founders in this movement against child sex abuse, holding authority figures count- accountable. You mentioned SNAP, which I want everyone to know is Survivors Network for those abused by priests. That founder or one of the co-founders, David Koesi, he had introduced you during one of the book tours or book launches for Justice Denied. And David had mentioned that you were a tireless advocate for children. You went on to mention, and I thought it was great, in the beginning of that book, you talk about a message or correspondence that you had received from a woman in her 40s. Do you recall that? Because I'd love for the listeners to know about that. It's so inspiring, frustrating, and really bring home the point as to why the statute of limitations were such an obstacle. Oh, yeah. So she was one of the people that I spoke to that just steeled my nerve to say, okay, I'm just going to sit down and write this book. And I had to write it not for a legal audience. It had to be written for a general audience, lawmakers, et cetera. But she contacts me and she says, I see you've been writing your column about statutes of limitations for child sex abuse. And I just wanted you to know that I reached out to my father who sexually assaulted me as a child. I'm in my 40s. And I sat down with him and I told him, you no longer have any power over me. And I know that you are my rapist and you know that too. And I'm going to sue you. And he calmly looked back at her across the table and said, the statute of limitations will protect me. That's chilling. And then I heard more and more stories of families and institutions altering their behavior to benefit from the statute of limitations against the victims, that it became clear to me that this was evil in action and that it had to be stopped and that nobody else had done the research but me. So I had to get out there and fight it tooth and nail. And then, you know, I mean, it became a joke. (laughs) It has become a joke in our household, you know, which group that is revered have I insulted today? <laughs> um, my husband frequently asks me that, you know, whether it's the Boy Scouts or the Boys and Girls Clubs or the Catholic Church or the Orthodox Jews or Church of Scientology. And it's funny because I always have a new one to add, but it's because you just have to speak truth and knowledge to power. You have to. Yep, you have to. It's these historic institutions that are unfortunately, and it's not, I know you'll agree with me, it's not everyone, but these historic institutions who are failing to address toxicity within their cultures to hide it. And I think I'm I'm going to use your, or try to paraphrase, you know, the perpetrators are being, they're being cloaked in anonymity. They can stay anonymous and use the statute of limitations to give context. And we know the numbers are startling. One of the reasons why I, another one of the reasons why I wanted us to have this conversation is because I want this to be amplified. I want this mic, I want our conversation to go out to, if we awaken one more person, that would have been, you know, goal, mission done for this conversation. The numbers are astounding. Um, As of, and I'm pulling this, some from the organization Rain, you know, So one in nine girls, one in about around 50 boys will experience sexual violence by the time they're 18. 82% of all victims are female, age under the age of 18. Our population, our communities, I mean, there's this amazing, horrible ripple effect where sexual abuse, sexual violence is touching all of us. You told a story once that I read about when your daughter was being baptized, I think it was, and you didn't know it at the time. I think you were saying that you were looking at a picture and then come to find out later on that that individual who was baptizing your daughter was actually, there were allegations against that individual for being a sexual predator of young boys. Do you recall that? Oh, yeah. I mean, it chokes me up frequently because my beautiful daughter was baptized in the Catholic Church. My husband is a 
cradle to grave Catholic, a bit of a you know militant, but yeah, cradle to grave Catholic. And it was in the church that we would attend with family in our neighborhood. And the man who baptized her was a serial pedophile. I mean, he used the youth association in the church, the CYO, in order to get access to these kids. But I met one of the victims later on, and this was a person who was so incredibly damaged by what had been done to them. They lived alone with a dog that would, was a protection dog between them and every human being. This man was evil. He was charming. He was handsome. He was the hope for that church. But finally, the church acknowledged he was a problem, took him out, and they, they had to go back to their former priest who had heart problems. But I wouldn't begin to say that the sadness I have, that that's the person in my daughter's baptismal picture, measures up to anybody who's been used. Right. But I do think it's a great example of the ripple effects of the cover-up. If he'd been taken out immediately, he wouldn't have been there to baptize her. You talked about some of the tools that institutions are using. One of the tools to continue or to cover up, not face the what has been done, the violence that's been done to children within their congregation or within their youth groups, organizations, are the statute of limitations. You also mentioned the insurance company. Can you, I know in particular, you spoke about the bishops of the Catholic Church and the power that they've used. Can you tell the listeners a little bit about your encounter and your experience with that group? Well, with the bishops, I mean, they're kind of funny to me at this point. They have acted as bullies in the media toward me because I'm literally challenging their their secrets that they still have. And they fear losing money, but they, they don't fear losing money nearly as much as they fear losing hold of any of the secrets that remain because they're all so damning. And so I, I was taught an important lesson. You know, the world in, in 2005, I was part of the team in Philadelphia that came out with the Philadelphia Grand Jury Report on the archdiocese here and sex abuse. And, you know, immediately, as soon as the report was released, there was all of this cry from the bishops about the district attorney and the team was completely biased against Catholics. It was anti-Catholic, which of course was baloney. But they lost the ability to make those arguments because the truth kept coming out. And so, you know, it's been my view, regardless of the power that some of these men hold, the truth still takes them down. And so that that I think is what every woman needs to understand in this, in the hard fought spaces, in the places that we find ourselves, that the truth really will bring down to size the bullies that insist on trying to keep us in our place. And I don't think there's any better example of uh, what needs to be done by women in this space than during this month. So the bishops bullied me, but in the background, lobbying with a lot more dollars and a lot more persuasiveness under the table, basically, was the insurance industry. And you know, the insurance industry is supposed to be our risk prevention mechanism. We're supposed to not fall down on sidewalks because insurance makes buildings clear their sidewalks. And we wear seatbelts because of insurance. And we have anti lock breaks because of insurance. So I, I finally came to understand what I think is one of the systemic problems, which is that for too long, insurance companies viewed themselves as defensive. They were the defense for these organizations that were letting children be abused. They're the ones that, of course, fomented non-disclosure agreements and bargaining to the last chip on every settlement and making sure that nobody ever knew what really happened in this organization. But we are pushing really hard and with some success of explaining to insurers that they are part of the solution if they will let themselves be. And we are now working on, we have created through social scientists something we call the gold standard, which is a set of child protection policies that are useful across all youth serving organizations. And if insurance would start making that part of their underwriting, we could enforce safer spaces. 
So that's good horizon, I think. That's awesome. I want to turn now and talk to something that is specifically near and dear to my practice. And that's what Child USA studied, is working on the athletes and the Game Over Commission. Talk to us a little bit about that, that work that you've done with that. One of the, when I look at the Game Over Commission, there was one quote that I saw on the Child USA website where it stated that competitive gymnastics and other elite sports break children. And to put it in context, it was a study, a case study on the systematic abuse by the perpetrator, Larry Nasser. What is the Game Over Commission? What do listeners need to know about that? So it, it's a group of 15 experts in the field. These are national level experts, some of the smartest minds in the country, like Dr. Sharon Cooper at UNC, Dr. Stephen Berkowitz, a psychiatrist at University of Colorado, but a mix, brilliant attorneys and some social scientists and doctors. And so the task we gave them was, we need to figure out what really happened. By that point, we knew that Nasser had sexually abused hundreds of girls. So we knew that part. But my question was, how did every institution that should have protected these girls let them down? Not a single institution did them a favor. And that went all the way through the gyms, the national governing bodies, the USOPC, the whole structure of elite sports and the way money is distributed and withheld. But it also went through the FBI. All of the law enforcement agencies failed these girls. So, and so that's what we studied for three years. And I am so proud of the report that we released in late January, which set out from the view of these experts what each of these systems did wrong and then how we think they must be fixed. So the bottom line is that there needs to be a principle introduced. If you can believe it, this is needed. A principle introduced at the top of the Olympic movement it needs to be introduced by Congress and it needs to be athletes first. Athlete well-being should be the centerpiece. Um, and then guess what? It turns out that the social science tells us that if we insist on the well-being of athletes, their amazing performances even become better. So I urge everyone to read it. It's on our website, of course. And the set of recommendations are on page 50 to 51. And we are already actively speaking to Congress about amendments to the law that will protect youth athletes in sport. Parents out there that are listening to this, I know that, Marcy, a lot of our listeners are parents of elite athletes, elite gymnasts, definitely read this report. When I get calls, individuals calling, telling me, you know, what's happened to their daughter, what's happened to their son, a lot of it in gymnastics. What I find is that there is a repeated pattern, and it's exactly what the report identifies. Every institution is letting them down, and it's still happening today. Yesterday, on the 3rd, in the Orange County Register, Scott Reed put out a, another a really great article in reference to um, elite gymnastics coach Valerie Lucan. And just chronicling, and several elite gymnast Olympians are quoted in there. They're mentioning the physical, the emotional abuse, the suicide attempts that young girls seeking some type of relief, the self harm. And here's the thing about this, Marcy. He was, I don't know if he still is, we'll give USAG the benefit of the doubt. He was being considered for a top post up until, you know, early January of this year. So maybe I should send USAG this, uh, your, this report. I don't know. Well, you know, one of the things that we've been doing is following the coaches that are problematic. And when we found out that the Olympic coach that was selected for the winter 2022 games for men's ice hockey was a man who had routinely covered up the child sex abuse going on in the Blackhawks organization. And then they were going to select him to be the coach. And they did select him. We immediately wrote a letter and said, that is unacceptable. 
if you mean it when you say it, that you're going to create a better culture, then sending someone to Beijing who's been covering up child sex abuse of boys is just wrong. And uh, not long after, he was removed from the Blackhawks and from being an Olympic coach. So that's what it takes. It's what it takes. You've got to name names and tell the truth. And this, this news story that just came out is so in line with everything that we know, which is that the system empowered those who would willingly, physically, emotionally, and sexually abuse athletes. And frankly, one of the simplest fixes that we're recommending is cameras in gyms. I think every gym should have a nanny cam that mom and dad can jump on at work and see exactly how their child is being treated. Right, right. It's just uh, they've worked with impunity for too long. It's because the system has let that happen. And we're rounding out and wrapping up this conversation. One of the things that I noticed within my practice and representing so many of these brilliant young athletes and their families, the complaints, is that there is always the prevailing sentiment, belief of shame, shame in all of its iterations, shame by way of, I must have done something wrong, or it's the parents who are just racked with guilt, feeling that this happened on their watch. As we end this out, from the studies that you've done, from speaking, from writing the books, what can you leave parents and survivors whether they're elite athletes or not, what can you leave them with as far as coming out of this shame, knowing the work that you all are doing and other brilliant experts are doing to remove these obstacles? Do you encourage them to continue to speak out, to tell their stories, regardless of the passage of time? What can you say to them? Well, what I say to parents routinely is your children are at higher risk than you know. And you need to become highly protective of your talented athlete because the whole world will use them. And it's not that I'm blaming the parents, but that the parents didn't know that sex abuse is so common, right? I mean, according to our social scientists here, just finished a a literature review, one in five girls and one in 13 boys are going to be sexually abused up to age 18. Look, that's a lot of kids. A lot. It's happening. Yeah, it's happening. And a child alone with another adult is at risk. It doesn't matter how much you trust them. Your instinct may well be wrong because pedophiles really look for parents to groom and open the door. But the other thing is, I think there's hope. We really do have concrete recommendations for fixing the system as a system in the Game Over Commission report. And we're just about to announce that we will. We're about to launch phase two of the Game Over Commission, and phase two will be focusing on families, the NCAA, and the AAU. So it's time. We'll look for that. Yeah, we will definitely, definitely look for that. Marcy, this was great. We went from discussing the celebration of Women's History Month, talking about uh, what you know to be your very intimate view of having worked for justice, the first female United States justice. And now here we have a historic nomination in Judge Brown Jackson. And we've ended it on telling parents, telling survivors that this problem is here, but there's solutions, there's solutions by way, and really encouraging individuals, whether you are an athlete, a parent, whether you're a survivor of any type of abuse, be it sexual, physical, or psychological, please go to the Child USA website. Marcy, I'll tell you, there are a number of times that, you know, if I'm preparing for something or if I know that I'm looking for numbers, statistics, or even just, you know, looking for recent changes in the statute of limitations, I am on your website. It is a great resource. And for that, I know on behalf of my listeners, I thank you. And thank you so much for this conversation. Thank you. It's such a pleasure. Awesome. So Child USA and it's and the Game Over Commission, that report is also on the website, correct? Yeah, it's on the homepage. And so is the Hamilton Library, which is, you know, a curated collection of materials for survivors, parents, teachers, lawyers, just a safe space to browse. 
Excellent. So I think that would be a great link. But thank you for doing this. You're so kind. Excellent. All right, Marcy, you take care. And until next time, everyone, be well. Take care. Bye-bye. All information and content in this podcast is provided for entertainment purposes only. Nothing in this podcast shall constitute legal advice and shall not create an attorney-client relationship. This information is general and may not be applicable to your particular circumstances. You should review your particular circumstances with an attorney. All liability with respect to actions taken or not taken based on the contents of this podcast is hereby expressly disclaimed. <laughs>